Banjo-Kazooie has a lot going for it. An iconic soundtrack, great visuals, a ton of personality, among many other things. I mean, it's considered one of the greatest titles of its era with almost universal acclaim, selling over 2.2 million copies worldwide. And the clamor over the series continues to this date, with the recent overwhelming success of its spiritual successor, Ukulele. So it's pretty evident that Rare knew what they were doing, and implemented some very smart design choices in the game that even perhaps kickstarted an industrial push into the mainstream market. But before I go there, let me put this in a little bit of perspective. Booting up a game for the first time is like going on a first date. The game needs to draw you in, impress you, allow you to get a feel for it a little more, and even set the overall tone of the experience, you know? Pretty much prior to the Super Nintendo, most games obviously didn't do this at all. They just threw you right into the action, and you had to learn the ropes from an external teacher, like the handbook or a friend, for example. But I mean, let's be honest, video games in this era didn't need tutorials or intro sequences. The interface was already simple as is, and it was really easy to teach yourself without becoming overwhelmed. And most games designed their levels while keeping this in mind. But then, the market grew, consoles strengthened, and controllers got more complex. You couldn't just toss a player right into the action without any context anymore, otherwise they would grow frustrated and confused and would stray away from the game. So what's a dev gotta do to solve this issue? Well, many games utilize drawn out tutorial sequences in order to introduce each concept and mechanic in the game in a controlled environment, while more basic games typically install a difficulty curve as the player moves onto each level, with new mechanics being introduced as the player gets more and more skilled. Some games even just throw you into a peaceful area and allow you to get adjusted to the controls and setting before approaching challenges. Like Mario 64, for instance. But Banjo-Kazooie manages to concoct the perfect blends of all of these things and turn it into a kick-ass smoothie of good game design. Or something like that. Here's what I mean. Upon starting a new game, there is an introductory cutscene that displays the conflict at hand as well as the quirky personality of the dialogue and characters. This little segment does a very good job of setting the tone and humor for the rest of the game. Anyway, after this cutscene, you leave the comfort of your home and are placed inside of a spectacular hub world, sprawling with mini obstacle courses, a mini river moat thing, and even some enemies. This area that encompasses Gruntilda's lair is perfectly structured to cater to both newcomers and platforming veterans that wish to brush up on their skills. As soon as you exit the gates of your home, Bottles the Mole will prompt you to enter the tutorial mode. The way in which Banjo-Kazooie teaches you the basics is where it sets itself apart from most other games. Accepting the tutorial prompt will disable your basic moves until you gradually learn each of them from molehills scattered around the area. This is a highly guided method of learning the basic mechanics, but it instructs new players in a safe environment in order to keep them feeling comfortable. It feels a little restrictive, but not too restrictive because you're still able to move around to any molehill in any order at your own free will. Furthermore, while these molehills are pretty easy to spot, this mini-quest to find them all introduces a key concept to the game. That inspection and exploration of the world around you will reap rewards, so in this case, your basic moves. Not to mention the numerous shiny collectibles placed somewhat close to these molehills, but I'll get to those in a little while. Anyway, if you're like me and don't like reading or slower paced tutorials like the one in Banjo, then you can choose to avoid it altogether and receive all of your basic moves right off the bat. This enables you to explore freely and freshen up on the new concepts at your own free pace until you're ready to enter the main hub, much like outside of Peach's Castle in Mario 64. But unfortunately, the first time I played this game, I accidentally chose the tutorial mode. Stupid A button. I was a little skeptical of the tediousness and lack of freedom that the tutorial provided, but I mean, the entire rest of the game is extremely open and free. So a little bit of restriction at first to teach the player everything before, you know, they roam free is perfectly okay in my opinion. Think of the tutorial as if it were a concerned parent teaching their kid how to ride a bike. The kid in this metaphor is the player. Flaps on some training wheels and doesn't let the player leave the driveway until he's learned how to ride the bike. But once the player is comfortable, he can roam wherever he pleases and learn some swaggy new tricks as he gets better. I really appreciate how Rare tried to cater to all levels of gaming experience with this option to play through the tutorial or skip it. This is an idea that wasn't really practiced in years prior. The choice truly opened the gates for players who are new to the gaming scene, with the tutorial, as well as seasoned gaming veterans who have already been accustomed to the way games like Banjo-Kazooie work. The game made sure that it didn't alienate anyone, and I mean, it's pretty evident by the sales figures that Rare successfully pulled in a vast amount of players, both rookies and vets alike. So anyways, like I said before, if you didn't choose the tutorial, then you'd be free to roam the area until you're ready to enter Grunty's Lair. The beauty of this area is that the landscape of it enables players to learn whether they are being guided by the tutorial or not. There's a moat to figure out the swimming mechanics, some lowly enemies to grasp the combat mechanics, and even a mini platform section to hone your athletic skills. Look at this little bit right here. The platforms are spread out close enough so that you can test out your normal and double jumps, but when you try to jump to get that honeycomb, you can't make it. This means that you have to utilize another move, your backflip, in order to reach higher altitude necessary to reach the nice new shiny item. That's another beautiful thing about this area, the small collectibles scattered around. 
Like I said, these collectibles incentivize you to go out and retrieve them, but in order to get them, you need to master the basic skills that are required to do so. Some of them are very cleverly placed, like the example I just talked about, and they make the player think and adapt to the challenge. It's just really smart game design that allows the players to learn concepts without them even realizing it. And for a sprawling 3D platformer like Banjo-Kazooie, these types of designs were critical in familiarizing the player before he or she embarks on the huge journey. It's no wonder that Banjo-Kazooie lives on in the minds of millions of people today. It wasn't just the humor or the music, it was great design choices like these that made it such a classic staple to the Nintendo 64. My name's Ninjani, and that is why Banjo-Kazooie's intro segment is awesome.